Downton is a great house, and the Crawleys are a great family. I think from the start, we wanted to have these layered stories, this big story, this little story, this long story, this short story. And to do that, to make that work, you do need quite a lot of characters. It's why the casting is so crucial, because actually, in order to distinguish between them, you must have tremendously strong actors in all of them, so you don't muddle up this footman with that footman and this maid with that maid and so on. But we, we got very lucky in that. We were aiming right from the beginning for a kind of West Wing structure where there was this going and that and the other, and then you couldn't really, you couldn't turn around and, and look at something else for five minutes. You know, you have to stay with it. Your Lordship, William. One of the reasons I love Highclere for Downton is because of its personal statement. When you come down the drive, it is a statement of aristocratic confidence. The people who built this house believed in themselves. They believed in their role in society, and that is very useful to making it a character, which is what the house has to be. And that as you come in, is echoed in the hall with endless armorial displays. Every bride, every countess is there. Her armigorous descent, you know, enriching the family of Herbert. And, of course, the family of Herbert becomes the family of Crawley, and what is, in fact, the story of the Carnarvon family becomes the story of the Grantham family. So in that way, I think the entrance in the hall tell our story for us wonderfully. But my favorite room here is the library, which I think is one of the most beautiful libraries in England. Uh, you know, every nation, well, not every nation, but there, there are many nations that have perfected one particular room. You know, you, the French drawing room, the Austrian ballroom, the German dining room, and, so on. and I think the room the English get right is the library. And this is a particularly spectacular Please. example, very much conceived as a whole, where the ceiling the carpet, the chimney piece, the portraits, the books, everything is there telling you that you are in the informal sitting room of a great nobleman, which is what the library is. And, you know, I think it's an extraordinary room. If I were here, I'd never leave it. I think it's a very hard question to answer why the whole structure of British society seems to have a sort of enduring fascination. Um, I think there is a sort of nostalgia at times for a kind of ordered world where everyone knew what was what, you know, and they didn't have to wrestle with an invitation saying casual chic. What does that mean? Well, you knew if it was dinner, this is what you wore. <laughs> Someone asked me today, did I want to see the return of manners? And I don't particularly care whether people know how to eat lobster or, or how to address a French duchess, I, you know. But I would like the return of more courtesy. I think we've become very discourteous. And for me, any working society, it, one of the key factors is that everyone should have some respect for everyone else. Can I help your ladyship? I was shocked at the talk I heard as I came in. Mr. Crawley is his lordship's cousin and heir. You will, therefore, please, accord him the respect he's entitled to. But you don't like him yourself, my lady. If we're to be friends, you will not speak in that way again about the Crawleys or any member of Lord Grantham's family. The friendliness with Anna and, and Cora's imaginary friendliness with, with O'Brien. Um, I think all of that is true. I mean, people nowadays think, oh, you know, every, every servant was hideously treated, and it was all ghastly. I mean, obviously that wouldn't work. I mean, you couldn't possibly have someone in your bedroom helping you into your long johns when you didn't like them. I mean, that's just, it's not realistic. I mean, of course, they played by the rules. But I always remember an aunt of mine telling me, which I used in this, was that no matter how friendly you were when you were alone in a room with your maid, if you met her in the hall and there were lots of people and she was just crossing the corner of the hall, 
there was no, you didn't do that at all. You went, you went back into your roles. And it was only when you were alone that that real friendship came out. We will be seeing a lot of him. I don't expect so now. Because we rather hoped Lady Mary might have taken a shine to him. Seems not. Oh, well. There are plenty more fish in the sea than ever came out of it. Evelyn Waugh once said novelists don't make much up. And, and the truth is, any writing means that you rush at your own life like a sort of dressing up box and rip stuff out. I did know a chap who was discovered to be the heir of a great estate and so on and so forth and was living a very different life and was brought back to live there and get to know it. So that obviously was an inspiration for Matthew. I had a cousin who was taken over by her former lady's maid who was turned into an absolute tyrant who was the basis of O'Brien. My own great aunt, Isie, immortalized once by Maggie Smith as Lady Trentham in Gosford Park, has sort of returned, rejigged as Lady Grantham in <laughs> Downton Abbey. Funnily enough, in a way, the sort of farthest out story of the series, which is the dead diplomat in the bed who then has to be carried through the house by the women, uh, that's a true story. What happened? I don't know. Oh, did that guy suppose for a stroke? But why was he here at all? That happened in a great house of some friends of ours, and he only found it because he went into the diary of a great aunt. And what was interesting is this man did die, and they woke up these women, and this group of dowagers and debs sort of carried this corpse the length of the house. And of course, they did it because they knew if it ever got out, they would be touched by the scandal and they wouldn't be able to throw it off. And what is interesting is that they managed it. Nobody ever found out. It was only because he read the diary that he found it out. And when he looked up in the diaries of the house of the other people and so on, it's just this sad tragedy of this diplomat who was found dead in his bed by his valet. Now we know how he got there, love. So, um, you know, you, you, you pick these things up along the way and then something comes right to include them. Sometimes you develop them for actors. The footman, William, was played by Thomas House, who turned out to be this really good pianist. And so we wrote in the fact that he plays the piano all the time. So you do tend to kind of move things around to fit the actors. And also, you know, they acquire their own dynamic. I mean, a relationship on screen seems to work well, and so you write a bit more for it and that kind of thing. I think you have to sort of, in modern parlance, stay reasonably loose about that and take advantage of what you're being given. Yes. <laughs> William, give us a tune. Come on, Daisy. Go on. <laughs> Hands up. <laughs>